grow tired of Christian life? If you're all your friends in Christ, whine about who they should have lived. Wouldn't it be nice to just show up and have a victory dance with your friends instead of a pouting session, you know? About how the I was pillaged this week and run over by a truck. And, 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 by the way, I had a really good week. I had victory this week. It's embarrassing. I had, not one, two 10-year-old prayers answered this week. Let me start with the victory. Let me do a little dance here. My little group dance. I just want to uh, just, just stay out with that. You know what I'm talking about? I yeah. posted it on Facebook this week. Anyway, uh, <laughs> 10 years ago, Go to when we were formulating a plan to launch a church, uh, I met a guy named Bill Barker who was out in uh, mm -hmm. Kentucky, <laughs> Appalachian <laughs> Regional Ministry. And we were one of those evangelism <laughs> events, and he said, Sounds like the area that you, you're in is a whole life like Appalachian. You know, you got rednecks. You know, in an urban context. And uh, I'm going to put you on our list as part of Appalachian Regional Ministries because you're dealing with the same problems we are. And we've gotten, you know, encouragement and some clips and articles, and it's pretty much been happening over 10 years. Well, a month ago, I. Uh, read an article about uh, a national movement called Send Relief and how they, they were trying to do these backpacks for hope. You know, weekend backpacks for kids with food. And that's been on my heart for you know, several years because of the problems that we have in our community. And uh, starting next month, our nonprofit's going to get financial stipend to help us deal with the problem. We started praying for that stipend 10 years ago. And it's just now coming. We adopt a school every year and try to bless a few kids with Christmas. I had one of those, oh, by the way, while we're doing that, have you applied for the North Carolina partnership with the backpacks for Christmas? I'm going, I didn't know that there was such a thing. Oh, let me send you the app. Well, he said, request 10% more than you need, and we'll see what we can get you. We're getting backpacks for Christmas to plus 60 to 80 kids. Shoes, coats, toys, backpacks. You have not because you asked not when you're asking this. And I'm just saying that that's a victory. That's a victory. You know? So, talking about identity theft. Uh, in Him. That's the verse for the series. We're in Him to move, have our, have our being. And I, I want, I'm tired of the tuckhead. I am tired of getting beat up. I'm tired about coming home and found out you've been robbed. You know, spiritually speaking. And I, I know that you are too. And let's talk about this identity theft. You know, Satan is real and he robs us. Satan is real and there is a war going on. Just like in the world. Do you know what these, this, this is? This little little flat paper sleeve. Have you seen this? Hold your bank card. Do you know how powerful this card is? This little piece of paper? You see, it's designed to keep your cards from being skimmed. Uh, back about uh, six, eight months ago, uh, I received a note from Target where I had a card and saying someone skimmed all the, like a million target cards. Recently, my uh, youngest daughter 
I was at the bank making deposit and discovered that, oh, she took a ride in Uber in San Francisco yesterday. Her card got skimmed. And you see, if you keep your card in one of these little protective pockets at all times, the guys with the little electronic devices that are walking through the store that are going to walk up to you and, and touch you and touch you in the backside on your wallet on your purse, trying to read your cards, they can't read your cards if it's in here. Little device that the banks can come up with. You know, they they were uh, our target at Springfield Mall is a notorious targeting spot for skimming. It's also one of those places where in the um, parking lot, and I've seen this, guy sitting out front of the mall, and he has uh, a clothesline running across his back seat and their phones hanging down. And what he's doing is sitting there trying to pick up signals of people using their cards. So why? Because they want to steal the identity and take your cash. There is uh, another thing, they dumpster dive. They go into businesses. In the business that I work for, we shred everything. I mean, that shredder is as big as a mailbox sitting up outside, you know? And we shred everything. Why? Because they dumpster dive. They want to get your information. What else do they do? They fish. They pretend to be financial institutions, sending spam and pop-up messages so that you would give them information. There's a scam right now where telemarketing, they're calling it and saying, do you know you owe up the IRS money? And call this 800 number and we will help you deal with the situation. Well, it's a, it's a fraud, it's a scam. What they're trying to do is get you to, well, you know, prey on the, on the people that don't know any better. What they will do is they will, if they get your mail, they will send in a change of address form to that location, that bank and redirect your flow. Listen, there's a organized effort globally to steal identity and to steal financial resources. What's worse is there a satanic world that wants to steal and rob your spiritual identity. And that's what we're going to talk about. This movie clip this morning from On the Waterfront, front, famous scene. We can identify with the pain and the heartache of someone who's lost their identity. He was searching for something. He wanted to be somebody. He, the whole movie is about him trying to become something. But yet it's out of reach. We feel that way as Christians many times. We feel like, wow, am I ever going to be? Am I ever going to be something? Am I ever going to make it? Am I ever? And our, and what we're doing is we're totally looking for our identity in the wrong places. Turn with me to Second Corinthians five, and I, I want to. I'm going to start, and we're going to go as far as we can this morning. And this is going to be over two, three weeks. But I, I want you to grasp. I want you to. Some of you have some of the most glorious post holes, foundation footing holes that I've ever seen dug. They're perfect, right down to the bedrock. You've taken time and you stuck rebar in there and you did little twisty ties and you built that little frame, you know? And then all of a sudden you've got the bright ideas, I gotta start building upon this thing. And you never poured the concrete. When you gotta pour concrete, you gotta let it set up to be able to build the house on it. Second Corinthians 5, 14 says this, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore we have died. And he died for all, and those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. But from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though that we have once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, and the old has passed away, and behold, new has come. And all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling 
the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We've got a, a fellow, that I've talked about this a number of times, uh, Pluto is his nickname. I have watched the life of Tommy McKnight for the last four years. First time I met him four years ago, he F-bombed me. We were standing on a street corner in a little Beirut up the road here. He was in a halfway house. He was desperately looking for food. And uh, we took him a food package. And that became the journey. Over which time we gave him a Bible. We shared Christ with him. He came to Christ. Praise God. And the F-bombs became only once a paragraph instead of every sentence. It became a, uh, oh, Chuck, Chuck, we gotta pray. We gotta pray, man. Man, you know, and he, he's shaking and he's got all this going on in his life. And we would stand on the street corner, two or three of us, we hold hands and we pray. Very neighborhood, that sometimes you hear gunshots. And he prayed, he'd be thankful for just what God had given him at that moment. And you see, this young man's life is a picture of reconciliation. He was first reconciled to Christ. And then he went through all this pain, all this process. He now has his own apartment. He is sharing it now with his brother. He is reconciled not only to his brother, but it's to his dad. He's brought his dad in. His dad's an elderly senior citizen and has some health issues and needed a little help, so he got him a senior box. You know? And he brought his dad. Four years ago, his dad wouldn't even let him come to his house. And there's been this reconciliation where things have been made right. You and I are just like Tom. It's like Blue. We're troubled. We got problems. Some of you have subscriptions to your issues. You know? Yes. You know, some of you really do. I mean, it's like, and they're colorful. They're interesting stories, you know? And you've got, you've got to realize that you've been reconciled to the King of Kings. You have been set free. It says here, all has become new. What don't we understand about that? We've been adopted, you know? We're in his family now. We're his. All is new. The past is the past. It's gone. It's, it's flushed. It's washed away out to sea. It's gone. And we have this new life. Why do we wrestle so much believing it? I'll give you four quick things about this verse. One, Christ died for all so that we, so we have died too. Christ died for our sins and he's paid for every one of them. And when we are in Christ... We have died to sin, and sin no longer has power and control over us. The stuff, you know, Neil, Neil Anderson talks about in his book, Bondage Breaker, that by being in Christ, the, the ties, the stickiness, you know, the, 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 the stuff that was attached to you in your old life are broken. It's gone. It's not going to come back. It's been paid for. You've got to accept it. You gotta believe it. Second thing, Jesus, since Jesus died, we are no we no longer live for ourselves. That is what sin, that that's what sin does. It makes us all about me. It's about my desires, my longings, and wants and reactions and feelings. I no longer live selfishly in Christ. One of the things about the lost world is it's all about me. I could have, I should have, why can't I? And when you come to Christ, there's that hope. Wow. We're broken servants. Why? We, we don't bless people because we, we're getting something out of it, even though sometimes we do. We bless and serve people because we were blessed and served. Because we tasted and experienced, and we realized that it's no longer about us. It's about him. I tell people, when they ask me, well, why do you do what you do? I said, because the only thing that matters 
is when we get to the other side, who did we take with us? Think about that. Think about the next time you're sitting at the ball or at a bench or, at your, or, or in the cafeteria at work and you're looking around the room and you're seeing people wandering by. You've got to sit back and start asking yourself, am I sitting here because that person needs Jesus? Because you see, there's coming a time and a day when we are on the other side of the veil. And those people who have not come to Christ will go into the lake of fire. And you will see people that you have witnessed and seen and talked to pitched for eternity. We don't live selfishly anymore because of that very reason. We're in Him, we're in Christ. Because we are in Christ, we want others to be in Christ. Three, we no longer recognize according to the flesh. We are recognized according to the spirit of salvation. God sees us not as sinners, but as saved in Christ. And we see each other that way too. Listen, the world, the, the, the scriptures talk about that the world is going to look at a church based upon how we love each other. The world is going to look at you and say, how, do you, how much do you care about your fellow Christian? Are you put, what? It's kind of like, we've had some colorful characters in our church over the years of people that say, why do you put up with them? Because God says I'm supposed to love them. God says I'm supposed to go the extra mile. God says I'm supposed to go over and pick up after them. Why? Because that's what the scripture teaches. God no longer recognizes your flesh. Do you understand how powerful and revolutionary and how light earth shattering that concept is? God doesn't look at your flesh. Ark of the Covenant is the best picture of this. You see, in the Ark of the Covenant, there was this box, and in the box was what, what, what the elements that were in the box represented the law and God's justice. And on the top of the box was a seat. And the high priest would come in once a year, Day of Atonement, and pour out the blood on top of it, making the blood sacrifice. And on the lid of the box were two angelic ornamental creatures that had these wings, and they looked down at the seat and at the law. And they looked through the blood that was poured out in the seat at the law. And friend, that's how God looks at you. He no longer looks at the law, but he looks at the fact that the price was paid. The blood was shed. He was in Christ. And you are set free. And he doesn't look at your sin and your problems anymore. He looks at the fact that he's going to She's going to Third, fourth thing. And so that anyone in Christ is a new crea creation. Your life has changed. Think about this. We've been set free. All's forgiven. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west. Try to figure that out. And yet, we have come to Christ. We've said the prayer. We know we've been changed. But we refuse to believe it. We, we allow this enemy. You know, John 8, 44 says, The devil was a murderer from the beginning not holding the truth, and there is no truth for him. When he lies, he speaks in his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. His, his process, if you go to the book of Genesis, for the entire 10,000 years of mankind, ish, is he comes up to you just at the point of blessing and says, God didn't really need that. What did he do to eat? Where did he get to eat? Did God say? God really say that? Twisting scripture, twisting truth, saying, look, look how crummy you are, man. Look how filthy you are. Look at that sin in your life. I saw you look at that chick that was just walking down the sidewalk. I know you looked at her legs. What's that got to do with anything? God doesn't look at my flesh. He looks at the blood of Christ that was shed for me. What I want to do today is I want to start a process to fortify you, to 
to build you up. I want to talk about the schemes this morning. And next week we'll get into the, some of the more deeper solutions, the fortifications that you need in your life. But let's talk about the strategies of the enemy. What are the four things that he does in your life to mess you up? Number one, he gets us to believe that we are our own behavior. Oh, Pastor Chuck, you don't understand. I'm blah, 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 blah. Pastor Chuck, you don't understand. My mom, she raised me like blah, 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 blah. Look, Everybody Loves Raymond, one of my favorite TV shows of all time. I was Robert, okay? You know, my mom was that lady, queen of guilt, okay? I realized that my mom's been dead for two years. I had legitimate cause to go back and sue the broad for verbal abuse, okay? I know what I went, you're nodding your head. You had the same kind of mom, you know? That there was always a tough word, there was always you aren't good enough, always that you could have done better. By the way, at the same time, she's manipulating behind the scenes, telling how everybody how great you are, and ruining all your friendships because your, your mom's, it's gotta be coming for you, you know? I'm like, no, it's my mom living vicariously through me, you know? I mean, you know, I was a music kid, you know? Listen, we end up getting hoodwinked because we start believing the creds. We start believing the crypt notes. We start believing that we really are these people. Well, we're not. Bad experiences and painful past can negatively affect our present. Now listen, I've been a senior pastor now for, I'll give you some history. I've been a senior pastor now for 10 years, Gordon. I've been in the ministry for 30 years. I have been saved effectively today, 39 years. Came to Christ Labor Day weekend 39 years ago, 1977. Married 37 years to the same woman. She deserves a bronze star, you know, if not the Congressional Medal of Honor. The devil wants us to believe that we are the ones who suffer from those issues that are unchanging. We believe the notes. We believe the stuff that the world has said about us. Why are you doing that? Stop that. It's one of the enemy's tactics to get you to believe what isn't true about you any longer. You are what? A new creation in Christ. What are you? You are in Him. What are you? You have been forgiven by the cross. What are you? You are covered by the blood. What are you? You have been set free. What are you? You've been adopted into the family of the king. Do I need to stop there? And yet the enemy says, you're so-and-so. You can never be someone. Second thing. He gets us to believe that we don't measure up spiritually. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. I'm not good enough. When you, I actually had some narrow-minded, fundamental Bible preacher tell me this one time. When you overcome X, Y, and Z, God can use you. been a Christian, you've been walking in the Lord a little bit. And after a couple years, you realize I haven't been a good Christian, as I could have been. I've sinned. I've made mistakes. You know, I feel like I need to get baptized all over again. I need to do it over, you know. I need a mulligan. The point of the matter is that the enemy will get you to believe that you don't measure up, that you're not good enough. I, as a pastor, I, I got a little rabbit trail that got me off. The last 10 years, I've been pastoring an artsy church, okay? This is sort of like base camp for artists. You know, you come in, you're out doing your ministry, you're here for a little bit, you know, and you get fortified, build up, go back out, do what you're doing. The point is that I have never had a week, David uh, Chandler and I, 
you go back 10 years, he was one of my first guys that was here. And David and I used to talk about this over time. He said, have you noticed that we always have somebody out of the ledge with writer's block around here? I said, yes, the nature of pastoring to artists. We always have somebody who is ready to jump off a building because their career has reached a crossroads. We always have somebody who's crisis because of creative block. Oh my, you know, God's never going to use my art. Oh. We don't measure up. It's more. You do measure up. You're in Christ. It's been paid for. All things are new. Do I have to keep repeating these things over and over? You see, you need to start rehearsing. Yeah, the Bible says you have to start rehearsing these things in your mind. Because the enemy is going to be sitting there at the foot of your bed in the morning going, good morning, loser. You know? I'm going to show a clip next week. One of my Methodist friends sent me this week. You know, uh, the girl who plays Abby on uh, NCIS, uh, she is a Christian. And she shared in the clip her take on Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's pretty cool. And it talks about, by the way, this is one of the solution verses, Romans 1 and 2. Yeah. Uh, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, the, the, the fact is that you don't measure up because you haven't fortified yourself. Third thing. I won't keep you long. This is the number one thing that I get from Christians. You ready? The enemy gets us to believe differently than the Bible teaches. How many times I heard it yesterday at the party, someone say, I just don't believe that anymore about God. My experience, here's one of the great ones. My experience as a youth was so horrible in that church, I can't go to church anymore. Hey, I was a youth pastor. My experience as a youth pastor was so horrible working with uh, listen, I had no gray hair and all my hair until I started working with adults, okay? And my experience as a youth pastor was if I was constantly running interference for the people who hated kids. And they generally were the senior ministry staff, okay? I worked for five pastors. One of them's in the room. He wasn't one of the tyrants. But I worked for five guys, three of which, two of which were tyrants. How high, how far, and when may I come down? And can, can we please nuke the children? You know, I mean, you know, it's just, wow, you know? I got yelled at and cussed out so many times for kids messing up rooms that I didn't even have keys for, and those rooms were locked when we had the events going on. You know, oh, they were in that room again, they were doing, I said, dude, the room is locked, I don't even have a key, nobody had a key to that room. Oh, it had to be the kids. So, maybe it was your kids who you let ride a bicycle through the building, you know? Uh, people get this funky idea that I can pick and choose what Bible verses to believe. I can make up my own theology. I don't believe that anymore about God. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And the moment that you stop believing that, you're screwed. God doesn't change. He doesn't give up on his promises. What he said, when God says, hey, there's no guardrail there, and there is a 90-foot drop, and there's a whole bunch of nasty, gnarly things at the bottom that are going to crush your life, don't ride too close to it. When we say, ah, that doesn't mean anything today. That's not appropriate in this context of life. And you get on your little bicycle and you ride on the road, car comes down the road, you go, oh my, you fall over and you crash and die. And you blame God. And God said, I told you. I told you there wasn't a car around there. I, I pointed out the rocks below and the sharp glass and you know the five other guys that are laying there all busted up and crippled because they didn't listen to me either, you know? And yet we live that way. We live that way because it, it's like Life has been so hard. The enemy has been so discouraging to me. I'm choosing that I'm not going to believe that part of the Bible anymore. That's the number one thing that I hear from Christians that messes up their lives. They totally get off track. Now ask yourself, how many times 
have you heard someone who says they're a Christian who purposely pick and choose what they want to believe and obey? I am going to walk off a 40-story building because I believe gravity no longer applies to me. That's essentially what we're saying. Fourth thing. Oh, I'll give, you, I'll give you a closing verse for that. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never pass away. I used to carry a Bible, and now I carry one of these electrical things that I have, 77 Bibles. It's a whole lot easier if paper thin on my bookshelf instead of all that, you know? But um, the longer I do this, the hunger I am for the Word. The longer I do this, the more I want to get in the Word. The longer I, I, I do this, in you know, 39 years, I've learned some things. You know what? And some things don't change. Things I learned 39 years ago still work. And I don't want to give up. I want to keep going. I want to keep pressing in. Last thing. He wants to get us to give up and reject the faith. The enemy wants you to quit. Listen. I have two daughters in college. I've raised eight kids. Um, first girl we had is, dear Lord, she's so messed up. She's been institutionalized. Uh, God bless her. Her mom was bipolar and she would never take her meds. And the kid was in and out of foster care. We had, we had her for such a short time. But it breaks my heart knowing how messed up she is. And I knew 25 years ago when we got her that in a short period of time we had her, that it was going to take a miracle for her in her life. Two Irish boys that are back in Ireland. And uh, we had them for a very short window so the grandparents could come over and, and, and get them secured. And we had count, my wife was reminding me, we had count, count we, we, we learned the principle of chair rail. Anything above the chair rail line had a, a possibility of not getting broken. And because um, these boys were quite active. And uh, we, we, we hung out with the grandparents. And we were able to teach them and share with the principles that we learned about raising kids. And we helped them become better parents to these kids because their, their father was in jail. <clears throat> I had my three Puerto Rican boys. I referred to the, it was like walking in and the Dodger outfield was in my in a bedroom all together playing catch with some other kid, you know. Um, they were an amazing group of kids. Uh, two of them came to Christ, two of them um, two of them actually helped learn to read during the year that they were with us. Um, one is now trans transgender and uh, uh, still talking with her. Um, and I have my two babies and they're in college. said all that to say this, there have been countless times in the last 25 years that I've wanted to walk away from my faith. I said, I can't take this anymore. I can't take the verbal abuse of church. I can't put up with people tearing me down and calling me out and saying, why, why, are you, why, why aren't you doing this with your life? You know, why are you serving God? You know, the challenges, the issues, the stuff, the garbage. And you know, one of the things that kept me going was I looked at the kids. And I said, I can't give up. I can't give up because if I give up, they'll give up. Listen, Matthew 13 should be your passage that you read this week. It talks about one of the things, it talks about people that were choked off by the thorns. And I'm going to leave you with this thought today. Don't allow life to choke you off. You're a new creation. God has got a wonderful plan for you. He's got principles and benefits and promises that you're endowed with. You just haven't figured it out because you haven't valued the Word of God and got in the Word of God the way you should. You have friends in your life who are negative. They're just toxic. Change your friends. You know, if you've got toxic people in your life, get rid of them. 
I'm serious as a heart attack. You have people, if you have people in your life who are constantly beating you up, chewing you up, spitting, spitting you out, spiritually or even physically, why are you putting up with that? Either if, if it's a spouse, get counsel, you know? But I'm telling you, you can't allow this toxicness to go into your life because the enemy wants to wipe you out. You need to surround yourself with godly people of all generations who will build you up, who will encourage you. You know, one of the things as a youth pastor that I treasured, I had elderly people, I and mean, we need more of them in this church. I had elderly people that would send me love notes. You know, when I was at New Horizons, when I was at Darley Road, when I was at Darley Road, I became a, a pastor. I had I had my 12 gray hairs. And those gray-haired ladies, every week one of them would write a little note out with a little verse, put it in a little card. Sometimes they were thank you cards, sometimes they were little blank cards. And they would, I would find it in my back pocket when I came home from church. They'd stuck in the it, stuck it in there. And they would tell me things about myself that God said about me. They said, I just want you to know that God believes this about you. You know? I had some of these ladies, when I gave them my, every month they demanded I would give them the eight things that I wanted to accomplish this month, and they would pray over them. That's how our coffee house got started. One of the ladies said, we just need to give me a list. Let's pray for the musicians. Let's pray for this. Let's pray for the opportunities. We ended up being written up in the, uh, in the Wilmington News Journal as one of the leading coffee houses in the city of Wilmington. I didn't even ask for the article, you know? Why? Because somebody heard that. But this, this long and the short of was I had these ladies who were praying for me and I felt the prayers. If you don't have that in your life, you've got to cultivate it. You know? If you want to, if you want to succeed in life and you want to avoid doubt, you can't spend a whole lot of time by yourself. Because the enemy's there in, the, in that shadow. And he will whisper to you, he will tell negative things about you, he will say, ah, I got him on the ropes. Let me, let me, let me bring so and so into his life. Screw him up royally. Don't want to be Marlon Brando. I mean, he could have been somebody. You know, he really could have been somebody. I was reading online about him last night. Uh, he had three wives. He had, they think, seventeen children. Uh, the three wives, I think, only had six of the 17 children. He bought an island in the South Pacific, actually 12 islands. And one of his kids actually lives there by himself now. He was a recluse. He got messed up. He really got messed up. You think about the brilliance of his career. You know, he took 20 years off. He got messed up, he got depressed, and went away for 20 years. And then came back and did the Godfather. And then decided that I'm not accepting the Academy Award. I'm sending an Indian princess out in full Indian garb to accept the award. If they don't like it, I'm not taking the award. <laughs> you know? Listen, you can go crazy with the junk in this world. You can have all the talent in the world and never be used by God only singly because you've chosen not to believe his word, that you believe the enemy, that you believe the negative people that are around you, and you've chosen to walk away because of all the junk. Well, I'm, t I'm telling you as a living, a living, breathing example, yeah, I messed up. Yeah, I'm too creative. Yeah, I don't always th finish things well. Yeah, I take on too much. I can, I can list about 47 things, you know? But the one thing I have discovered is I'm never quitting. It's work. We just finished a series on how to, how to thrive and how to be successful in life. I can guarantee what the enemy is doing this week is he attempted it with me. Doubt. Okay. Next week, we're going to look into the protectants. The things that you can do, there's four of them, things you can do in your life to be able to uh, fortify yourself to have good success. 
So let's pray. Father, this morning we just come and we ask that uh, change our hearts. I'm, I'm grateful, Father, for this message because I needed, it. I needed to be reminded of the position that we have in you. And Father, this week would we bathe ourselves and go deeper into the Word of God and, and fortify ourselves and evaluate the relationships and the friendships we have and realize where we are short and where we are weak and Lord where we can build ourselves up that we're able to fortify ourselves so that we can continue to thrive. Pray your blessing down your son's name. Move upon our hearts as we close in worship. Amen. Mm -hmm.